guys, it's Christina again. While we're waiting for the gathering to start, we're gonna continue with our Minute to Win It Challenge. This time, we have blue team versus black team. Let's go ahead and draw a game. This week's game, this blows. Now let's take a peek at the instructions. The game is this blows. Each team has eight cups. Each contestant has their own balloon. Blow up the balloon and expel the air to blow the cups off the table. You may not touch the cups with your hands or any other part of your body at any time. First team to blow off all the cups from the table wins. We're gonna do this couple style where they'll be standing on opposite sides of the table, alternating cups. Let's check it out. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you guys next week. Well, good morning, True Grace Church. We are so excited to have you a part of this gathering, whether you're here in person or you're watching online. Uh, if you guys want to stand with me, the Lord has something for you today. So let's worship together.
of the goodness of God.
I just want to be where God's presence is. Amen. There's a lot of great things in the world, but being in the presence of God, where you feel his presence, you feel his anointing, you're honoring him and you hear his voice. There's just something about that that you can't, can't manufacture. The Bible does say that God inhabits the praises of his people. So what I've noticed is when people are setting aside their own thoughts and needs and preferences and wants, they're saying, God, I'm just all about you right now. God seems to show up when people are selfless and instead focused on him. And uh, I, I don't know if you know this, but I pray for God's presence to be in your car with you. And I pray for God's presence to be in your living room and in your backyard. I just think, God, we want to feel your presence at home like we do in church gatherings. A lot of people right now are at home having church, you know, and I just pray, God, just fill that room with your presence. So I want to pray today and ask the Lord just to be present in your life. How many would love to have the presence of God in your workplace? How many are like, that would take Jesus? And that's okay. Just try working at a church sometime. It's incredible. I just want to ask, Lord, would you just bring your anointing, your presence, your power to our homes, to our kitchens, that we wouldn't have fighting and strife and angst and all the stuff going on in the world and just all the limitations and frustrations, but that our homes be filled with joy and peace in the very presence of God. Can we bow our heads together? Lord, there is something about your presence there's something about just the anointing and the joy and the peace. And Lord, when we're in a place where your presence is, we can think clearer. And Lord, your presence can be in our homes so richly, so powerfully. And God, I pray, Lord, that we might be alone in the car, but we would not be alone. Lord, that you would speak to us, that you would minister to us, that God, your voice would be louder and clearer in our lives than perhaps it has been in many, many years. And Lord, I pray that as you look upon your church, you don't see people who are thinking about themselves in the middle of a time of worship. But God, that we would be able to set aside all of the me and be about you. And so Lord, in this prayer time, we honor you. We acknowledge you. We worship you. You, you are God and we are not. And we understand that and we love that we don't have to try to pretend that we're God. But we get to acknowledge you in all of our ways. So Lord, would you fill our homes with love and laughter and peace and joy. Work out those relationships that are hard. Bring your blessing to our lives. But Lord, let us bless you in the choices that we make, in the decisions that we make to honor you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. Okay, so if you're at home, you get to hug everybody around you, but you're at church, you gotta be careful with that, all right? So elbow bump somebody, wave at somebody, say hi to someone before you're seated. Good morning, True Grace. It's so good to have you uh, at our gathering on campus and online. I just wanna remind you of some upcoming events that we have. First is our men's tailgate party tonight. Doors open at 4.30, kickoff is at 5.20. It's free, and if you haven't had the chance to sign up, you can still come. And I, I saw this really cool Vikings pinata in the uh, church office this week that we get a bash in sometime tonight, so I hope to see you there. Also, we restarted our Recalibrate series last week, and we have life groups that are going through discussion guides. So if you haven't had a chance to sign up for a life group, go to our website and make sure you sign up for one. And part of this Recalibrate series, we want to have a night of worship on November 1st. And this is going to be a great time of celebration, but we also want to baptize people and just make it a, a great, awesome night. And so if you haven't had a chance to be baptized and you want to be baptized on November 1st, Stop by the info counter to pick up, pick up an application 
or you can go to our website and visit our baptism page to sign up there. It is only three weeks away, so if you want to be baptized on the first, uh, make sure you turn in your application to the church office, the info counter, or online by next Sunday, October 18th. And it's time to bless our offering. So if you're on campus, there's a box at the back of the sanctuary that you can drop off your offering uh, after the gathering. And if you're online, click on the chat and link, and it'll take you to our website where you can give. All right, let's pray. Father, we just come before you, and we just want to thank you for all that you've provided for us. In this world, uh, you are our Lord, and you are our provider, and you've given us life. And so we want to stop in this gathering and honor you first and foremost with our money. So we just bless over everything that we are about to give, that you would take it and you would use it for your kingdom and your glory, and that the gospel would be preached not only in Lacey and Thurston County, but throughout the world with the generosity that is given today. In Jesus' name, amen. My name is David Allen. I just needed a church to go back to and um, found out about Freedom Session. Thought I'd, okay, I'd give it a shot and see what that's about. I came to Freedom Session mostly because I was having issues with pornography. It was starting to overtake my life, quite honestly. The interesting thing about Freedom Session is that it brings out other stuff too. If you allow God to do his, do his thing, uh, he will show you other issues that you're having and, and, and he'll help you through those. You see a lot of why you do things you do, why you've gone through those things, and you release them to God and let him take them over. It's very difficult, but worth it. Our freedom session was kind of cut short a little bit over this pandemic thing that we're going through. God is faithful, even if you decide to turn from him, which happened to me. For me, I literally had to stop studying the Bible. I had to stop all the stuff that I was doing in order to fall into, go into my, my, my pornography and all that other stuff. And what I found was the minute that I did that, I had this horrible, sickening feeling. I went back into the Word, and He has been amazing in this last few months. It's just been amazing what He's doing. You know, without, without the Freedom Session um, tools that you are getting, um, I wouldn't be where I am right now, for sure. He uses everything. Whether good or bad, he uses it. Thankfully, he's on my side. <laughs> amen. Man, I love that story, amen? Because it's a purity story and everybody deals with purity in the world, amen? Yeah, Pastor, her. <laughs> that, bird, that guy right there, right? I love it in our church, we can be like honest, like, hey, we're all dealing with stuff. And purity is one of those battles in people's lives. And I just love that it's real. And, and I just appreciate his story so much that God can take the, the, even the good and the bad things and he can use it to bring good. And he even mentioned, David mentioned uh, that he um, pressed into uh, reading, really reading the Bible during that time. And uh, as he was saying that in the last service, I just remembered the story. Um, years ago, we were going down to California, and I had like 80 teenagers with me as a 24-year-old youth pastor. And we were going down to California, work at Gleanies for the Hungry, we were feeding starving people around the world. It was kind of a mission trip, service project, loved it. And we were down on Highway, or excuse me, Freeway 99, not I-5, so it has like these, you know, like really narrow shoulders. And a suburban full of teenagers broke down on the freeway. You don't want to be the 24-year-old youth pastor. You're like, oh my gosh, get those, get those kids off the freeway. Like, you're a youth leader. If you die, we'll deal with that. But we got to get these kids off of the, off of the road. So we had this, this suburban, like 1980, super heavy suburban, like in the, in the shoulder of the fast lane. So the tires were like almost on the lane of the freeway. And I was like, this is not good. We need to do something about this. And so we finally got some adults around it. And there was no police helping us out at this point. And so we were there on the side of the road. And uh, we decided to get a jack up. But there was no jack in the Suburban. Like, what kind of a youth leader are you if you're driving these students around? So another youth leader pulled around in her car. And she said, I have a jack in my car. We can get it up. And now there's this giant, big 1980s, like, Chevy Suburban. 
and the youth leader that drives up to help is in a Volkswagen Passat. And she pulls out her jack. And I go, we're going to do the best we can. So she pulls out her jack. She goes over and she, you know, you know, we get it all up. It goes as high as it can. It's not even touching the, like, the, the car yet. It's not even bringing the Suburban off the ground. I said, this isn't working. I said, we need something to put under the jack so the jack will reach the Suburban. I said, what do we got in the car? I said, well, we got Bibles. I am not kidding you. They brought out one Bible, two Bibles, three Bibles. They stacked them up, and then they put the jack on top of it, but it just touched it. It didn't take it off the ground. So we got up to about eight Bibles. <laughs> this is a true story. Eight Bibles on the side of the freeway in California with the jack on top of the Bibles. The Bibles went, you know, and then we got it just high enough that we pulled the, the wheel off, and we stuck a new wheel on, and we changed the tire, and then I came back to church. And I said, I've got a story for you. And I said, you need to be reading the Bible. The Bible's important. And we went on the side of the freeway. We put our Bible up there. I said, listen, I got to know, are you jacked up on the word of God? Because we were last week, man. It was amazing. That was a, that was a fun weekend. Eight Bibles, and we fixed it. The gal who had the little uh, Volkswagen and Passat took her um, jack back to the dealership. She said, it bent. I was like, yeah, it bent. It was lifting a Suburban. That's probably why it didn't come out straight. Oh, wow. Man, it's great to see you today. We're talking about Recalibrate. And uh, this Wednesday, before I forget, this Wednesday from 6 to 9 in our church sanctuary. If you're watching online, if you want to come in, uh, we'll have it kind of just place, kind of spaced out. And it'll be a time of prayer. And we've done days of prayer. We just come in and you can spend as much time as you want. You can spend five minutes. You can spend three hours. So this uh, Wednesday from 6 to 9, the sanctuary is open for you. And some of you, listen, you need this time of prayer like you need oxygen for your soul. There's angst, there's frustration, there's, there's anger, uh, there's pain in your life, you're just not hearing from God. You need to come and just go, big deep breath, go to some prayer stations, find a place to kneel, maybe ask uh, some people who are here to pray for you, to pray for you. It's going to be an incredible atmosphere of prayer. So if you want that, it's being provided for you this Wednesday. Please take us up on that, all right? Okay, we're talking about recalibrate. And I love the word recalibrate. It's a six-part series we're in right now. And the word means to recenter, to refocus, to realign, or to tune up. Man, what a great word for our lives right now. To recenter our lives, refocus our lives, to realign them, to tune them up. It means to step back and to make some adjustments, sometimes even in a complete overhaul, so that something works correctly. And last week, the, the, the focus was recalibrate or stagnate. That if you don't stop and make some important tweaks and changes to your life, you will stop growing. Don't get stagnant. Keep growing. Keep self-correcting. Keep saying, Lord, speak to me. Change me. Mold me. Improve me. I don't want to stay who I am today. How many don't want to stay who you are today? There's so much more that God has for you. So I challenge all of us to do three things. Number one, to redefine success. To two, re-examine what is essential. Three, to reevaluate your relationships. And this one, number one, has been hitting me all week long. Lord, is my defini definition of success inaccurate? Have I taken the world's definition of success? Like, what, what is your definition of success for my life? That's what I want. It can't be about numbers. It can't just be about health or money. It's, it's really, for me, love God, love people, and serve the world. That's my new definition of success. How do you define success for your life? Uh, a few years ago, just actually, maybe it was just last year, uh, I was backing up my wife's minivan. It was a 16-year-old minivan. I just kind of threw it in reverse, and I backed it up, and I hit the basketball pole in our driveway. And when I hit it, I was like, what was that? And I, I pulled forward, and I saw the basketball hoop. Instead, it was here. It was leaned like this. Have you ever just said to yourself, you're such an idiot? Have you ever said that to yourself? Don't say that to yourself. Don't be like your pastor. And I remember just going, that was so dumb. Like, now I can't shoot on it, and it's going to be a major problem and hassle and stuff. And then that exact same moment, I thought, well, what do I have to lose? I've already bent it. So I put the front of the bumper on the, on the basketball pole. And I went, Mrr. I hit the gas. And, it, and it literally the pole just went back up. But then I noticed it wasn't straight yet. It was kind of too far or, or still lean this way. And it was lean to the right. So I put it in reverse. I went around. I went like this. And I went, Mrr. Mrr. about that time I see the neighbor in the cul-de-sac. What is the... 
Okay, so I'm just a redneck with my wife's minivan. I don't have a truck, okay, so I'm doing the best I can. And so it was kind of always off kilter, didn't work right. Um, and we had to do something about it. So, you know, we get out the level. Because how I many you know there's a, there's a bubble in the level, and the level doesn't lie. So I can put it up here on my TV and find out if that's straight. I can read the bubble right in the center and see if it's perfectly straight and flat, and it is. So I took this, and I took it, and I set it on the rim of my, I know some of you thought I was holding this up because I did an addition to my house recently. No, it was the basketball rim. I put it on the rim, and I saw that the rim was actually slightly off kilter. It wasn't sitting flat. And I realized all those three-pointers I was missing, it was the rim's fault. That's what was going on. <laughs> and so I got up there and adjusted that and got the pole, you know, back up straight and working right again. And, and, and it's interesting because sometimes life looks level, but it's just slightly off kilter. And when your life is slightly off kilter and you live that way day after day after day after day, suddenly you're veering to the right or to the left, aren't you? How important is it, is it for us to stop and recalibrate and make sure that our lives are working the way they were designed to and make adjustments? So what do you do when, you're, listen, when your soul gets off kilter? That's the title for today. Today is Recalibrate Your Soul. I want to ask this question again. How is your soul? It's a weird question, isn't it? How is your soul? We ask questions like, how's your job? How's school? How's your family? How's your back doing? But we don't usually walk up to somebody and say, how's your soul doing today? In fact, if we did, most of us would be like, that's, I don't know. That's kind of strange. Your soul, it's the real you. It's your personhood. It's not your, your body. Your body's temporal, but your soul, it's eternal. It's your true character. It's who you really are underneath. It's the essence of being human. Your heart, your soul, your spirit. Sometimes in the movies, the person's body will die, but then their, their soul kind of comes out of them almost like in a ghostly figure or something. Your soul, it's not just spiritual, it's eternal. And Jesus understood this, that we all have this soul, and he could look at people, and the rest of us, we kind of see people's bodies, but Jesus would look through your body to your soul. And he'd see the condition of your soul as it really was. By the way, he's here today, he's in the fourth row right here, you know, no, just kidding. But imagine Jesus is looking at you, and he sees right through you, and he sees the condition of your soul. What does he see when he looks at you and looks at me? Jesus found some people in his day and they didn't have a healthy respect, a healthy fear of God. They didn't fear the Lord. They, were, they weren't pagans. They weren't, you know, people that lived in the jungles that never, never knew the Lord. These were people of God. They were the church. And Jesus observed that God's people were growing, listen to this, less and less concerned with obeying God. They were growing less and less concerned with obeying God. And he saw that they were becoming more and more self-assured. And so in Luke chapter 12, verse 5, it says this, Jesus said, I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him after your body has been killed, has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Don't fear people. Fear the only righteous judge. He's the one that you should fear. And sometimes we get this mentality. We wouldn't say it out loud. Well, God, I'm a pretty good person. I think I've got this. And I'm going to say, no, don't be self-assured. Uh, what you've got is sin, and sin separates you from God. Always keep that, that humility, that brokenness, Lord, without you, apart from you, I can do nothing. I'm a qualified, accomplished sinner, and I need the forgiveness and the grace of the Savior. The man who is sure of himself is often unaware of his own depravity. When you realize your need for forgiveness in Jesus, when you find that freedom, it's beyond anything that this world can offer. I love to feel the forgiveness of God. I love freedom. It's kind of like somebody was put in jail for years and years and years, and suddenly they said, you're free. You're, 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 you're free to go. And they walk out in that sunlight for the first time, and the joy that overtakes them. It's like a person who, who bought their first house in Thurston County. Right now, somebody, you know, started buying a starter home in Thurston County, about $800,000 maybe now. And, uh, and, and 360 months from now, you, you write that last check, and you pay off that loan. And that huge weight is lifted off you. That debt is taken off you. The freedom you feel. Take that, times it by a million the freedom you have in Christ when Jesus removes your sin from your life. Doesn't mean you won't struggle, but he takes away what separates you from God. Listen, without God, the Bible says your soul is always lost. Without God, your soul is always lost. But Jesus gave his life so your soul would not be separated, that your sin would not um, 
be effective in separating you from God. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but Jesus said it. God sent the son to save the world through him. Now listen, Peter had spent some time with Jesus and he said it like this. He said, listen, once we were, you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. I love that, that Jesus is the shepherd and he's the guardian of my soul. I've wandered from God. My heart is prone to wander. I need the good shepherd. I am so grateful that he is a guardian in my life. So here we go. This is what I wonder. I'm wondering, how is your soul? What's the condition of your soul? And a second question is this, how has COVID-19 impacted your soul? Pastor, I am healthier and more joy in my life since COVID-19 than I've ever been in my life. Probably not, right? COVID-19 has brought some really unfair, unjust, ridiculous things to our world. What's the condition of your soul and how has this pandemic impacted your soul? Some of you, you're like mega frustrated. The, the problem is it's hard to see how someone's soul is doing. Like someone can tell you, you need a haircut. You can look in the mirror, I need a haircut. It's fairly obvious if you need to take a shower. If you have pain in your body, man, you can send for help. You can do something about it. But what about your soul? What about when your soul needs help in your life? What if your soul was visible? What if it, there was a mirror somewhere that could show you what your soul looked like? Maybe your soul is disappointed. Listen, maybe your soul is angry or your soul is distracted. I was in the church uh, about a month ago and my, my back was hurting really bad. Everybody else had left for the day and I came across here, was praying at the altar. My back hurt so bad, I just laid flat on my back on the altar like right here. And I was laying in the altar and I was just praying and seeing God. And where God's presence is, his voice is loud and clear. And sometimes what you actually think you're talking to God about, he has something else he wants to do with you. So I'm laying flat on my back. I'm like, God, I'm so tired. This is pain is terrible. I'm here alone in the sanctuary. Like, you know, Lord, if you want to heal somebody today in the sanctuary, I'm all you got. I'm the only one here, you know. And I'm laying and praying. And all of a sudden, I roll over on my stomach and I flip over my phone and I uninstall Facebook. Now, this is something my wife's been telling me for about three years I should do. Some other close friends are like, man, it's draining you. It's, it's too much access. You can't get anything done. It's and I just haven't thought about it. And it took three years of people saying something. And all of a sudden, one day, I just rolled over in 30 seconds. I uninstalled it. Man, there was some peace that first week. Because having that right there was just a distraction. There's good things that come from it, but it was a distraction for me. Maybe your soul is distracted. Maybe your soul is disconnected. The reality is this. When you are connected with God and other people uh, in your life, your soul is usually, well, it is healthy. Maybe your soul is sorrowful. Jesus' prayer in the garden was, was really clear. My soul is sorrowful. And maybe your soul is partly serving Jesus. That's an easy one to happen. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So here's the problem. It's easy to neglect your soul. Some of you take care of your body. You're taking care of your family. I mean, you're doing some great things in this world. You're serving in ministry and touching lives, but you're neglecting your soul. And you're going to pay the price for it. It's easy to neglect your soul. If your body's beaten down, you can't even walk, you have to stop and care for your body. You just, you're forced to. If you get an infection in your body, you have to do something about it. But your soul could be dying on life support, toxic, and you may not even know it because you can't see it and you can't define it. Sometimes we even say something like this, I'm just so busy right now, I can't stop and, and take care of what's going on inside of me. But if we don't take care of what's going on inside of us in our soul, there'll be worse problems. Jesus said this. He said, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? What do you benefit if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? What if you get so caught up in all the stuff of this world that you, you missed out on the point of life? Or what if you're so busy helping everybody else that you neglect your own soul and then you have nothing to offer anyone? Could I really lose my soul? Does sin really separate me from God? Do I really have to stop and recalibrate and look deep inside to see what needs to change? Jesus followed up with a question. He said, is anything worth more than your soul? Is anything in the world worth more than your soul? Like what trade would you make for your soul? Because I think the devil would like to make you a trade. Like if he drove up in a brand new Tesla with six Cinnabons, I would be like, oh, that's tempting. But no, no. Nothing is worth my soul. 
Continually, we must reevaluate the health of our soul. I looked online, I thought this was funny. I was like, okay, somebody said to me, you gotta do soul care in your life, soul care. I think like, that's a weird term. What do you mean soul care? And I started thinking about it. You know, that, that's probably a good thing to stop and care for what's going on inside. By the way, your family will thank you if you take care of your soul. And so I went online and I, I looked up skin care and I found out there was 25,000 products for skin care for humans. Not nearly so many for soul care. Take care of who you really are. So how do you measure the health of your soul? How do you know how you're doing inside? This is what I've discovered. When people walk up and they say, hey, how are you? And I go, I don't really know. That's not a good sign. I'm out of touch with my own soul. When somebody walks up and says, hey, how are you doing? I can say, oh, man, God spoke this to me. I'm encouraged. Uh, Good things are happening. Yeah, I've got these real struggles over here, but I like it when I'm in touch with that question. How do you measure the health of your soul? Well, let me ask this question. Do the things of the Lord, uh, do you long for the things of the Lord or do you long for the things of the world? There's an indicator there. Can you handle quiet? Do you want time with God? I love the question, what is God saying to you? It's an indicator of how my soul is doing. Well, I can't hear from God. I'm too busy solving my own problems and getting things done. Uh, I'm just trying to get through work and get through life and get through the pandemic. And, and if you don't stop and take care of your soul, you're going to have worse problems. Don't neglect your soul. I really felt like from the Lord from this weekend, he wanted me to say this. If you hate your job, not just dislike it, but if you absolutely hate your job, your soul is probably dying because it sucks every bit of life out of you. And you can't be you. If, if your job is that horrible. Maybe it's worth changing. Maybe it's worth having less money and having other sacrifices to actually have a smile on your face again. Maybe it's worth it. So how self-aware are you in your life? Well, I'm too overwhelmed to, to do what I need to do. I'm too overwhelmed to be a part of church or do online church or worship God. Hey, do something. Get aware. Don't neglect your soul. Whatever it takes, don't neglect your soul. So I'm going to give you today five uh, things, five practical things uh, your soul needs, all right? If you're taking notes, here we go. Number one, redemption. Redemption. You, your soul needs to be redeemed, and there's one who can redeem your soul. Ask the Savior, would you come and would you pay the price for my sins? I know I'm not the Savior of the world. I know I'm not the Son of God. I know I'm not perfect. I'm not sinless. I can't die for the sins of the world, even my own sins. So ask Jesus, the Savior of the world, to pay the price for your sins. Listen, don't let your life go unredeemed. I did a recent study this year, $3 billion of gift cards, unredeemed. Unredeemed. People buy it, give it to others, buy it for themselves, lose it, don't even redeem it. What a waste. How much worse is it for you to have your life and not have your sins forgiven? Lord, redeem my life. Don't let your soul go unredeemed. Your soul needs redemption. And if you're honest with yourself, you know that. The second one is this. Your soul needs relationship with others. I should say relationship with God and with others. Um, When we get comfortable without a close relationship with God, that's a sign it's time for a start over, do over, rededication. I've actually just kind of gotten comfortable not hearing God's voice. I've gotten really comfortable and complacent in this sin. It doesn't even feel wrong anymore. The world says it's fine, so maybe it is. Man, when you get comfortable with your sin and you get fine with a distant relationship with God, it's a bad sign for your soul. Maybe this, your soul stops longing for more. And that's an indicator for something. David said, my soul longs for the courts of the Lord. I want, I want the presence of God that the world cannot give. When your soul stops longing for more, it's time to recalibrate. It's time for a fresh start. We also need relationships with others. Man, when you don't have someone close to you, when you don't have someone that you can ask for help, Someone will ask you how your soul is doing. You be, you've left your lane, and you need someone to kind of help you get back in the lane. Good people who love God, who love you, they're needed in order to recenter and refocus your life. By the way, when, you're, when your life gets sidetracked on the side of the freeway, you want someone there to help you get back on track. And if you're alone, you don't have that. And if you're trying to serve Jesus alone, you're an easy target for the devil because you don't have the friends 
and you haven't built the relationships, the life group, the church family to protect you. Listen, I have no problem saying this. I want to be the hardest person in this church for the devil to reach. Just put a thousand people around me and put me in the middle. I have no problem with that. I don't want to be on the outside where I'm easy to get picked off the herd. I want to be protected because of great people in the church. Relationships with others. Work at that. Have that. Your soul needs relationship with God and relationship with others. Number three, your soul needs rest. Whether you want to admit it or not, your soul needs rest. And just because you've had some downtime at home doesn't mean you've had rest. It might mean you haven't had any rest. (laughs) Jesus said this. I love the paraphrase in the Message Bible. Are you tired? And a lot of us would be like, yes. Are you worn out? Yes. Are you burned out on religion? Man-made ways to follow God? Yes. Then come to me. Maybe even, maybe even come to the altar. Even today. Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced, unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Man, I want to travel lightly. There are so many thoughts in my head that drain the energy out of me that have no business even being in my mind. Anybody else? Why am I so distracted with that? You need rest, real rest in your life. Listen, soul care, don't neglect rest, not just for your body, for your soul. Number four, responsibility. These last two are kind of unique ones. Um, You need responsibility. Your soul needs responsibility. You need to serve. If you are living right now in this pandemic and, and, and you're not serving somewhere, you're not blessing someone somewhere, man, your soul is getting stagnant. Exactly what we talked about last week. It's like a pool of water that's not flowing in a river. It's stagnant. And if you're not serving and blessing others, man, you are not going to be satisfied in life. And just, just tell you right now, if you want to make sure that your life is miserable, don't serve others. Just focus inward about yourself, and it'll work just fine. You have to stop and be others-focused. When you are others-focused, it brings significance to your life. It brings joy to your life. It's how God wired you. you got to recalibrate where you're serving others. And sometimes we kind of get in a place, well, I just changed churches. I just changed jobs. We moved, and we just kind of focus inward for a short time. But get back out there and be about others. Be about others in the grocery store. Yesterday, I just got to be about others in parks and in our community, just talk to other people. And one of my kids said, what are you doing? I said, I just want to minister to people. I want my life to count for more than me. Look to minister. Look to serve. It's how God wired you. You have a responsibility. You need to realize the vital responsibility you have to be a blessing to others. You need to be a light if you follow Jesus. You have a responsibility to be a light in your world wherever you go. And then number five, restraint. Your soul actually needs restraint. (laughs) People say this kind of thing all the time. I just followed my heart. And I end up broke in, in five divorces, right? <laughs> like, like, literally, you need restraint for your soul. Your soul will go where your heart leads it. Your flesh longs for the path of least resistance. The path to easy pleasure and doing whatever feels good in the moment, that road does not lead to heaven. And maybe you've traveled that road. If something in life is worth gaining, it'll take some effort on your part. So decide now, I'm not one of those people that just takes the easiest path in front of me. I want to take the right path, the godly path. I want to decide now that I'm willing to work for what truly matters. Listen, you need boundaries in your life. We all do. You need restraint. You need to tell yourself, no, I'm not going there. So how is your soul? How has COVID-19 affected your soul? Jesus was in prayer just before, just before the arrest and the torture and the crucifixion. And John 12 says it like this. Jesus speaking, he says, Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. What I find so interesting is Jesus is in the center of God's will. He's doing exactly what he should do. Everything that he should do. The absolute best, the most important thing. He was accomplishing his life's purpose, and it led his soul to being deeply troubled. And I want to remind you today that sometimes your soul should be deeply troubled. 
Some of you Americans looking at the news, seeing some of the immaturity, seeing some of the foolishness, seeing some horrific things around you, your soul should be troubled in this nation. Amen? Really, it's, it's probably okay, and it's probably the natural outcome. In fact, sometimes you're persecuted because of your faith. A troubled soul might be a realistic expectation for Christ's followers. Jesus' soul was troubled, and he was in the center of God's will. So God, help us to realign, to recenter, refocus, and stay in our lane that's here to serve you. If you're 16 years old, I want you to block out this next illustration. But for the rest of you, if you're driving your car and you take your hands off the wheel, what happens? <laughs> right? What happens? You take your hands off the wheel. How long does the car go straight? Not forever. You got in the car in Seattle, Washington. You said, I I'm going to drive I-90. I I'm going to head over to Montana. I guarantee you, when you take your hands off that wheel, ever so slightly, it might just be misaligned to the right or misaligned to the left. You might be able to go 500 feet, 1,000 feet. You might even be able to go a mile, but you're not going across the country unless your life is aligned, unless your st steering wheel is perfectly aligned. The reality is this. Sometimes your life pulls to the right or to the left, and there's no time better than today Say, Lord, I want to recenter my life. I want to refocus my life. I want to recalibrate my life in you. So I'm going to ask if you just bow your heads to me for just a few minutes. And my prayer has been that this would be perhaps the most valuable five to seven minutes of your entire week, right here, right now. So Holy Spirit, Wherever we are, speak to us, minister to us, talk to us right now. Lord, we're living in a time of the world. Everyone needs to recalibrate. Lord, we need to redefine what success really is. Not what the media tells us is a success, not the world's definition. And Lord, without you, our soul is lost. But you are the guardian of our souls. Jesus, you came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. So Lord, today we're asking this question, how is my soul? And Lord, some of us, we've neglected to take care of our soul. And we can't do it any longer. On top of everything else, COVID-19 has come. And Lord, there's some people here today, God, and just honestly, our soul needs help. Lord, we don't want to gain the world and lose our soul. Nothing is more valuable than the soul you gave us. And so, Lord, today we do a diagnostic, a measurement of our souls. Lord, perhaps we've just gotten so comfortable in our sins that it just feels normal now. And maybe, Lord, we've been tired and grow stale and wanting to be in your presence. Lord, today I pray for redemption of our souls. Jesus, come in. We invite you. Come on, this is your prayer. Lord, come into my life and redeem my soul. Would you pay the price for my sins that I cannot pay? Lord, I want my relationship with you to be close. I want more of you. Lord, I need relationships with others. Lord, I need rest in my life. I know I have a responsibility to serve and be a light. Lord, I've taken the path of least resistance and it's not going well. Lord, help me have restraints, boundaries, self-control. Listen, if your life is pulling to the right or to the left, would you take these next few minutes and stop and pray and say, Lord, would you realign my soul? Would you help me to get healthy on the inside as I serve you?
I invite you to stand with me. 
Lord, some of us are facing unfair, even tragic circumstances. All of us are living through COVID-19. And God, those things that we can't control, those things that we have to release to you, we choose today to release unto you everything that is beyond our ability to, our power to control. And we say, Lord, it is well with my soul. I will trust in my Lord and my God. And we will worship you. We will acknowledge you. And Lord, when our soul is unhealthy, we will get healthy again. But we will not walk blindlessly through this life wondering. God, your presence, your anointing, your power is very real in these moments. And God, we just pray that being in your presence today would change who we are. Lord, that we'd be proactive and we'd be filled with your Holy Spirit and we would have power to our words and truth, God, in our lives and we would not believe lies. God, help us to define success in your eyes and go live it and let the chips fall where they may. If the boss doesn't like it and the family doesn't like it and the world doesn't like it and the media disagrees, we'll live your way rather than our way. We'll honor you with our lives. I pray the blessing, the power, the joy, the significance of knowing God just fill your church with a new day in your spirits. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Man, it's gonna be a good season. It's gonna be a good season in your life and in this church. God bless you. Wednesday night's a night of prayer. Make sure you encourage and you speak life and you bless someone today, all right? Have a great day.